So I want to introduce myself. I'm Renee Rossi. Thank you all for coming on this kind of rainy, sleepy day. So I appreciate it. Um, but what I wanted to ask before we got going is, who in here has a sleep problem right now? Okay. <laughs> Wait, keep your, put your hands up so I can see. I did. You did. Okay, so you're, you've been there. Sometimes. Okay, sometimes then. Yeah, sometimes. Who sometimes or all the time has a sleep problem at night? Okay. Who, now one more question. So I'm just asking a few questions because then I get an idea of a little bit of how I'm going to direct things. Who would, who of you would you say do not sleep well at least three nights a week for the past three months or for any three month period? Okay, raise your hands. That's three nights a week for three months or more. Okay, all right. And um, who has had a sleep problem and has gotten past it? You and you. Okay, we have in, in you for the most part. Okay. Because we want to hear from those folks, too. Um, OK. So you tell me when we, we want to get going. Parallels a number of things that are happening with sleep. So I'm not going to be talking about sleep apnea. However, if at the end we're going to have time for questions, um, I'm happy to entertain questions about that. But this lecture is about sleep physiology and sleep, and how can you get a better night's sleep, and what can we do to help ourselves sleep because we do spend a third of our lives sleeping. Um, and the other part about my background, besides being an ear, nose, and throat physician uh, for 32 years, is that I have also, for the past 20 years, practiced uh, Ayurvedic medicine. So um, many of you are probably not familiar with that. It's the most ancient form of medicine. Um, and it's the most ancient form of holistic medicine. So, um, and I'm just about finished with a master's degree in holistic medicine. So, so I'm bringing together both my background as an ENT and background in holistic medicine um, together for this talk. So, so I'm going to just start talking briefly about sleep and what it does physiologically because in the past 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot more research on why we need to sleep and what sleep does for us, things that we didn't know before. So I think it's really important to go over that so you understand that. And also, not only for yourselves, but for your children, grandchildren, <coughs> the public at large to understand some of this. You can also be advocates for sleep. So it's not just for yourself. So can everybody see this, or do I need to put it a little bit higher? <coughs> So basically, 100 years ago, less than 1% of Americans slept less than six hours a night. How many do you think, how many, what percentage of Americans do you think sleep less than six hours a night routinely now? 40%. It's, you're about there. It's about 33%. So about a third of Americans sleep six, or hours, six hours or less a night. Um, and I want to talk about the impact of that, because that's kind of a magic number, six hours, as far as sleep and what we need physiologically. <clears throat> so what is, there's, there's something called the recycle rate of humans. Every organism has that. And for humans, it's about 16 hours. So that means we can kind of, we recycle. After 16 hours, we need to sleep to recycle. And at about greater than 20 hours awake, we become pretty non-functional. And I learned this as a resident because for five years I was up either every other night or every third night without sleep, oftentimes 36 hours a night. So I'm very aware also of what the impact. Um, and I can tell you that way back when, before we had all the uh, electronic e e EEGs and EKGs and all that, I remember one night when I was on call reading an EKG upside down for 10 minutes. And finally, a nurse said, oh, you just need to flip it this way. <laughs> um, and I, I'm familiar with sleepwalking, which I did when I was a resident. Um, and I may have done some things while I was sleepwalking. So, um, so there's that whole. So anyway, so what happens now, we have researchers. So when you're awake more than 20 hours, particularly, let's say, with driving, um, there's studies to show now that actually the risk of having an accident is actually greater than somebody who's legally drunk. So we have a lot of 
we have a lot of work to do in that area. So we should never, ever drive when we're that sleep deprived. And how many, you know, we have a lot of people out there on the road doing that right now. Truck drivers, huge. And they also have a much higher rate of having sleep apnea as well because of the lifestyle that they have. So I just want to mention some of these things. Sure. Oh, no, no problem. So uh, adolescents are most susceptible. That's the, you know, the formation of medical, mental illness really mostly, and I don't need to go into all of that, but um, occurs really oftentimes starts when we're in adolescence. And that's when we have another big area um, where we have sleep deprivation. Because schools now, compared to 100 years ago, also they used to start after 9 a.m. And now they're starting earlier and earlier. And I'll explain why that's a problem. Because kids are being robbed of early morning sleep, which is really, really necessary for their health and well-being and for their mental functions. So, and I want <clears> to <throat> um, mention the technology genie. We can't put the technology, I don't know where I read that, but they call it the technology genie. We can't put it back in the bottle now, right? But it is something that we all have to be aware of and we have to live with. And I was just at a conference about a month and a half ago. It was a, it was a holistic medicine conference, and there was um, one of the speakers, it was on the mind, because that was the, the focus of the three-day conference was on the mind. And was saying, what is one of the, what, what he said is there's three things that he sees right now that are increasing neurodegenerative diseases, because they are on the rise, and I mean Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and we're not, it's not, it, it, they are definitely on the rise, along with a number of other things like autism, ADHD, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that he said that he sees as being really problematic uh, for our minds. There's three things. So one of them is technology, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, because it is reshaping our brains. We have studies from neurosurgeons showing that kids who have closed head injuries are taking longer to recover, um, and they think it's due in part to their technology use. Um, so one of the things is technology. Second one is meds. You know. 60 years ago, we didn't have the meds that we do now for our brain, right? Or, well, started in the 50s with Haldol and a bunch of, but we don't, we have a lot of meds that are, people are on. I'll talk about that in a minute and what these meds are doing. For instance, right now, well, how much extra time do you think you get from taking a sleeping pill at night? How much extra sleep? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Nine to ten minutes. I'm just letting you all know that because we're going to talk about that later. So meds, and I'm talking about all meds, psychotropic meds, just meds in general. And the third thing, what do you think the third thing is? I'm, I'm talking about it today. Sleep, not enough sleep. Yeah, really not enough sleep because sleep is imperative for brain health. So, yeah. Um, so, um, I, and, and just briefly, I want to mention, you've all heard about melatonin. People plug melatonin. Some people take it. Melatonin, our brains produce melatonin. It has to do with circadian rhythm, amount of light, and in kind of an inherent um, chronometer that we have in our body to tell us when to sleep. But melatonin is like the starting gun at a foot race, OK? It tells you when to start the process. It doesn't necessarily keep you asleep. It, so that's really what melatonin does as, as a function physiologically in our bodies. So um, melatonin production is severely hampered with blue lights, LED lights, screens, and all of that. And there's all kinds of studies. I don't need to go in, into it. You can look it up. But it really, really does a number on melatonin. So, and we'll talk about that in the handout, it's all in here, so you don't need to write this down, but about when people should stop using screens at night. And this also means TVs, so anybody with sleep issues. Um, so that's, um, but I don't need to go into all of it, but I can just tell you it's, it markedly impacts the release of melatonin and thus sleep onset. Um, and then I just want to mention Romans and lead, because we're all used to... Um, now, by now, we're all used to the internet. And I just want to say that um, in 2002, the uh, sleeping pill industry took a real uptick. And do you know what that was connected with by any chance? 9-11. There's no, 
9-11 could be part of it, but the other part was in that time period, we now had uh, over 50% of households had internet. And so it's really correlating, sleep problems are very much correlating with online activity. And I'm sure 9-11 had an impact too, because we can't ferret out everything. But what I do want to say is, um, I, I'm going to bring up the Romans and Lead. I put that there for me to remember that. Um, back years ago, uh, the Romans uh, used lead. And, and when I went to Pompeii, I was with a medical anthropologist. It was fascinating. He just happened to be in the tour group. But it was talking about how his interest in, in the lead pots. And so it really made me focus on those. And so they, the Romans would drink out of lead pots, right? And that's, they had lead pipes, lead pots. But they had a lot of wine in lead pots, too. And wine is acidic, and so it would leach the lead into the, so they had a lot of brain damage from drinking it. But everybody did it, so everybody did it. Well, right now, we're doing a similar thing. Everybody does it, and we're, we're, we're the guinea pigs right now. So, um, we, and we won't have the Visigoths coming in and the Goths coming in to overtake us, but what we might have <laughs> is that, you know, somebody through the World Wide Web overtaking us. I mean, we're so, at any rate, I'm just saying, we have to be smart about this because we don't know what it's doing to our brains. And particularly, all of us have to be smart about our children and our grandchildren. That's why I, I really want to educate about this. I think a lot of people are trying to educate about this. Um, dementia. Telomeres and aging, we know now telomeres are like the little caps on the end of shoelaces, you know, if, you know the little, so on our DNA. And they keep, kind of think of it as they keep our DNA from unraveling, just like a shoe, you know. And they get shorter and shorter as we age and our DNA starts. So telomeres are very connected with, um, or the length of telomeres with our physiologic age, not our chronologic age. So you can see people that have, aged telomeres that it doesn't match up with their chronologic age and vice versa, right? So one thing that really helps that is sleeping. Um, also, I just want to, I put Reagan and Thatcher here. What, what did Reagan and Thatcher both have? Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's and insomnia. They both boasted of sleep getting by on four hours or less a night. Nobody gets by on less than four hours a night. There is such a small percentage of the population that can, and I mean, it's way, way less than 1%. Everybody needs six hours or more. So, um, and that's being borne out. We're starting to see. And I, th I think another president that we're going to see have that is going to be Clinton. You can kind of already sort of see it in him, too. Um, but that he is going to. Well, that he, he, he doesn't look like he's all there right now. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Oh well, we'll 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 I think I think we're gonna see it with him too, yeah, and that gives some people solace and maybe not. Um, so I just say keep tweeting, <laughs> keep getting up at night, tweet from your bathroom, tweet yeah, tweet. Um, so basically, what I'm saying here is the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. The less your sleep, the more the more physiologic problems you're gonna have. Um, daylight savings. I mean, you've probably all heard this, you know, the day of daylight savings in the spring where we lose an hour, we have an uptick in heart attacks and sudden deaths, 25%. The reverse is true six months later when we switch it back. We actually have an, a, a decrease in heart attacks and sudden death events. This is well, you can look this all up. It's all there. Just with one hour, just with one hour. Amazing. Um, so the other thing that happens when we do not get enough sleep is we have increased cortisol, which is a steroid that we naturally produce, um, increased obesity, reproductive hormone imbalance. Um, I don't need to go into the physiology, but it's all there. It's, it's really, we're, we're seeing, and I'll talk about this in a minute, no sleep and immune function. It also really depresses immune function. They're very related. There is a genetic disease, I can't remember the name, you learn these in medical school and you forget the names. Um, but where people uh, sleep, they're, they, they stop sleeping in their 40s, 30s, late 30s, early 40s. They don't live really much more than about eight or nine months after that. You, you cannot live without sleeping. And you know what they die from? They die from massive sepsis or bacterial infection. 
and gut infection. So we also need sleep for good gut function, and we need it for immune function. So um, the World Health, Open, um, World Health Organization, WHO, has declared a sleep epidemic in four countries as of right now, the US, the UK, Jap Japan, and South Korea. And believe it or not, Japan and South Korea are worse than we are. <laughs> so, um, and then there's a connection, I said, with psychiatric disease. Yes, did you? I just, do you think that's because they are so into like, machines and technology? I think so, but yeah. Um, and psychiatric disease, there is no psychiatric disease that we know of that doesn't have a sleep impairment and vice versa. So we just have to keep that um, up there too. Um, our smoke alarm, our amygdala, an area in our primitive brain, in our lizard brain, uh, when we are not sleeping enough, we have hyperreactivity there. And I'll talk about that a little bit later um, if, and hopefully get to that. Shift work pilots who in Denmark. Okay, what I want to say is World Health Organization has also declared uh, lack of sleep under six hours a probable carcinogen because rates of cancer are markedly increased in people who routinely sleep less than six hours a night. So that's for sure. And in a few countries, and particularly Denmark, night shift workers who develop cancer, actually it's considered a, um, uh, what do you call it, a job, uh, work-related, work work yes, it, yeah. Uh, so they, they actually get compensated if they develop a cancer. So we're talking about uh, night shift workers, nurses, you know. Um, this is, this is there's, there's a whole hormonal cascade that's released when we sleep and we don't sleep. We know like for children, growth hormones released when kids are sleeping, particularly in the early hours of the night. And it, it's, it's required, but there's also other hormones that suppress and increase appetite that are reversed if we are not sleeping. So I used to notice as a resident when I had been up uh, 24 hours that um, I would be really hungry the next morning. And now that's, we know all about that. And so there's a higher rates of obesity in people that don't sleep. Um, so I don't know if this is all news to you or not. <laughs> um, so, hmm? I said we're convinced. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so yeah, and I want to get on to, because I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the physiology, and I'll sleep, talk a little bit about sleep architecture. Um, let's just see what we got here time-wise. Okay, um, so the three pillars of good health are sleep, food, and, and basically you could call it self-discipline, which would include exercise and lifestyle events, right? So what is the function of sleep? And I'm gonna go through these really quickly. It's a natural analgesic. So people, again, people who are sleeping or undersleeping have lower pain thresholds, right? They, they pain is more of a problem. Um, one of the more recent things, which is just fascinating, I don't know if any of you, you've heard of lymphatics, which is part of our drainage system in our body uh, for infections, for good health, and all that. Uh, those are called lymphatics. Now in the brain, they fall glymphatics, okay? So we didn't know that there was actually a lymph system in the brain, but we do have it, and they've called them glymph glymphatics. And that's our neurosanitation. So it's, and, and you know when it happens? When we're sleeping, during non-REM sleep. So, if the garbage truck goes and does all its cleaning up while we're sleeping. So it's an absolute necessity. So you can see, and there's studies also now looking at buildup of some of the beta amyloid and the funky proteins that occur in um, Alzheimer's. Um, those, if we're not sleeping enough, we're not cleaning up enough up in our brains. Um, Restocking of the immune system occurs, as I mentioned before. That's one of the things they found just by the folks that, that have that uh, genetic loss of sleep, that their immune function is completely gone. It is a neuro, sleep provides a neurochemical bath for our brains, um, and it also helps the microbiome. Have you been hearing this word a lot recently? It's a big tag word now, microbiome. Um, but anyway, it does keep happy you know, we're 90% we're not us, right? Most, most of us, I mean, we're, we're our, our gut and our body is filled with bacteria. 
the reason we don't look like a bacteria is the bacteria uh, cells are smaller than our cells. So, but they, if you count cells, they're 90% us. So microbiome in our gut is happier with sleep. Um, fitness of the cardiovascular, I can, I mean, millions, reproductive hormones. Um, and there is, the bottom line is, there's no sleep bank. When you lose sleep, you don't recover from loss of sleep. It's, you can count it off, okay? It's, it's lost, that time is lost. There's an, a saying in the Upanishads that says that, um, uh, which is in an in, in ancient text that, basically the same thing, that when, you, when you're not sleeping, your, your life is shortened. And, and it's been borne out. I mean, they said this thousands of years ago. So I want to read one little quote from, I don't know if any of you know Richard Rohr. It's, it's, it's called Falling Upward, A Spirituality for the Two Halves of Life. And um, he writes, he, there's a Carl Jung quote in here that I really like. One cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be of little importance in the evening. And what in the morning was true will at evening have become a lie. So one of the things about sleep, and why I like this quote, is that we have to nurture our sleep in our second half of life. It doesn't come as easy as it did before, as all of you that are here probably know. And one of the biggest things that I see and I saw it used to see in patients was if you do ask them about sleep, a lot of people are not sleeping well and not getting enough sleep. So um, just real quick, one more th thing on the benefits of sleep. I was talking about the functions, now the benefits. We have sleep spindles. I won't go into all of this, but they help with memory consolidation. When you don't sleep enough, you don't have enough memory. Everybody knows that. A bad night of sleep, bad night, or bad day of memory. And you don't consolidate the memory of functions or things that you learned the day before, including not just motor tasks, but mental tasks. So when they study students, college students now, the old, you know, students that, that pull all nighters, their retention is, it's, it's gone. And they never consolidate long term whatever they've studied compared to people who actually get sleep. And you can't recover that. Again, there's no sleeping. Motor skill memory, um, consolidation, I've talked about that. It's the only time that we are devoid of norepinephrine when, when we sleep. And that's one of the fight or flight hormones. So it's a calming of our sympathetic nervous system, our autonomic nervous system. That, so that's um, emotions are processed and consolidated, especially during REM sleep. Um, and I'm just gonna mention Mendeleev, because I way back when I was a chemist, way, 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 way back when, but Mendeleev is the one who came up with the periodic table, right, all the elements. And he, for years, this is a great story, for years he went around with cards, apparently, with all the elements, and he said, there's gotta be some way, or what he knew of the elements, that these all work together, and um, years. And uh, one night while he was asleep, the whole periodic table came to him and he got up in the morning and wrote it down and it has stuck till this day except for one element. So sleep, during sleep, there's a huge, not, not just emotions during REM sleep, but also during REM sleep, we also have a time for creative problem solving. So the adage, sleep on it, is really true. Um, so, and I just talked about that. I talked about neurosanitation. Neurosanitation and sanity go together. <laughs> kind of makes sense. And immunity. So I've already talked about that. And so I'm just going to really briefly talk about triggers later, show you the architecture of sleep. And I don't know if any of you have seen this before. Probably some of you have. We had to learn this. Well, that didn't work. Um, so I'll just put it back where it was. Um, basically, we have. As humans, we have 90-minute cycles. Every 90 minutes, we cycle through sleep. I mean, we hope to get four of those a night at least, preferably five. So I'm showing you one, two, three, four, five. And so the architecture of sleep is such that here's awake, and here's the deeper sleep, the slow-wave sleep. So when we're awake, we go through 
and we start the night, the pink here is, the, the width of the pink is our non-REM sleep. And REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. You've all heard about REM sleep? I hope I'm not putting you to sleep. <laughs> so basically, when we're awake, this is what an EEG, electrodes on our head would look like. Just all kinds of discombobulated activity. And look at what happens during REM sleep. It looks pretty much the same, but it's very different. So we're having this, and this is deep non-REM sleep, these synchronized deep delta waves, okay? Um, and basically when things are being, you can think of non-REM sleep as when things are coming and, and being transferred to the hard drive, right? So they're kind of being uploaded during this time. So EEGs just measure what's happening across the brain as a composite. So this is awake, a lot of these beta active waves. And then here we see the delta, the deep waves. But in REM sleep, we see the same thing. But the difference between REM sleep and awake is that when you're in REM sleep, what happens when you're in REM sleep? You're dreaming. What else is happening to your body? You're paralyzed. You can't move. Does your heart slow down? Your heart slows down. Actually, I'm sorry, your heart increase your heart rate increases in REM, in REM sleep. It slows down in non-REM. So um, when they do sleep studies, and I can talk and answer questions about this at the end, I can talk about what happens during sleep study for people that have sleep apnea or what have you, but all this is, is, is looked at. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to show you that REM. So there's very different things happening, even though at an outward glance it looks exactly the same. So I just wanted to show you that. And so anyway, getting back to this, we have cycles of non-REM REM sleep throughout the night, throughout these 90-minute cycles. And each animal has this, and it's determined by the width of our brainstem. So, you know, narrower brainstem, shorter cycles, etc. So it's fascinating that that's what Mother Nature did for us. But it, it goes all the way, you know, all the way back and forward with us. So non-REM sleep is in pink here, and you can see over the night, we have lesser amount of non-REM. Up here in blue is REM, and over the night, we have more REM sleep. So our early morning hours are really rich in REM, as many of you know, when you often wake up from a dream, right? There's more of a chance that you're gonna wake up from a dream, or you know, in, in the early, or remember a dream from early morning hours. We also have non-REM one and two, which are kind of the lighter sleep. You know when you're falling off to sleep and you're kind of hypnagog, you know, you're, you're kind of sort of in and out? That's our, non, our, our lighter non-REM. Non Deeper non-REM, really slow wave, like those waves that I showed you, are, are, are in, uh, in our deep, deepest sleep. Um, so, and this is when neurosanitation occurs that I was talking about, um, a lot of consolidation of memory and uploading of things to the hard drive in the brain from, you know, so, so kind of consolidation of experiences and what we've, what we've been going through. Yes? Yes, oftentimes people can, because you can see even right here, it's like this is just a, an example. See the little blip right here and here? Yeah, yeah. There's a, a you know, chance, but doesn't, obviously this person got right back to sleep though. But yeah, there's, there's a chance. During non, if you can get into this, the, the thalamus, which is the sensory switch gate in our brains, um, in our core, well, actually not in, kind of in the central brain, actually switches off our senses during non deep non-REM, not these. So you shouldn't be able, it's a deeper sleep, and that's why you can sleep through noise and smells and et cetera, right? So our sensory gates turned off at the deepest stages, not the lighter sleep, and definitely not during REM, okay? REM, you're paralyzed. Non-REM, you're not paralyzed. So sleepwalking occurs in non-REM. Does this make sense to everybody? Just to understand kind of what's going on. Giving, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, you talked about the fact that people tend to remember their dreams uh, when they're waking up. Did you mean that there's less dreaming before you wake up, or it's just because it's so soon before you wake up? It's just that when we, we typically, early morning, are waking up during, we're, there's more of a chance of waking up during a REM cycle. You know? When I'm talking about early morning, when people wake up. When you wake up, do, do, oftentimes it's more likely, like if you were to wake up at 6 in the morning, that you would remember a dream than if you woke up at 2 in the morning. That's all. Because it's, it's just that there's more REM occurring in those early morning hours. So there's more of a chance that you would wake up during a REM. 
And the, the, the issue, basically the reason I'm showing you this is the issue is that a lot of people are not getting down to the non-REM. Okay, and this is also when a lot of hormonal stuff is happening and, and that, so. Um, so I just wanted to sh hmm? So you tend to dream more in the REM state? Yes, REM is when you, but you can, you can have dreams in non-REM too, in deep non-REM, but by and large, most of dreaming occurs during REM, and REM means rapid eye movement. So that's when she, and you can see little babies spend about more than half of their night or half of their sleep cycle, and they sleep, newborns sleep over 14 hours, and a lot of it's in REM. So, um, okay, this is just a real quick, I know this is really hard to, but the, there's an urge to be awake and an urge to be asleep, and some of it's due to our circadian rhythm, which happens in a sine wave, and they've put the, the classic experiments were in, in the 30s, they put people in caves with no light somewhere down in, I don't know if it was Mammoth Cave or wherever it was, and they were in there, and as we get older, we have a little bit of a longer circadian rhythm, and younger folks don't. This is with the absence of light, you know, to see what, we have a circadian, around the clock rhythm that is, na you know, that's inherent in us. It's our biological time clock, our chronometer. Um, but we also have a sleep urge, which is separate, and that, that's what's called the sleep drive, and it builds up here, and it's about strong 10 to 11 p.m., right? About 10 p.m. And then it, it drops as we start to sleep. And, this is, and it kind of correlates with the, the dip in the circadian rhythm. So those, that's really when our sleep urge is about 10 p.m. at night, when we should be falling asleep physiologically. That's all I want to sh kind of share with that. But just to understand that we have... But, Circadian rhythm can be messed up with things like flying across time zones, right? Um, and you've always noticed, right, that is it easier to fly east or easier to fly west? West. Okay. So because we have uh, our circadian rhythm is a little bit longer than 24 hours. I can, I can explain that later, but I, well, I just want to get through. Um, so... As far as sleep drive, there's just one thing I want to tell you about this. This is a chemical in the brain that builds up and then it drops, naturally drops. There is one drug that affects this. There's several drugs, but one big drug, which is called caffeine. And what it does is it knocks off those, it knocks um, the adenosine off the receptors. So when you drink caffeine, particularly if you're drinking caffeine much after about 11 or 12 a.m., I mean 11 in the morning, um, caffeine has about an AR half-life right? And as we get older, it's processed through our liver. Our livers are a little weaker, right? Just like everything else. It, it takes a little longer to recover. So this is really aggravated by caffeine. Um, just wanted to show you. So there is a physiologic reason. So really, and probably, and, and I used to notice with patients that a lot of people would say, if they had caffeine much after about noon, they would have trouble sleeping. I certainly do. Um, okay. And then I just want to show you one other thing, and it's, our, and it's also related to circadian rhythm and to sleep, is cortisol, which is uh, the natural steroid that is produced from our adrenal glands, adrenal sitting above the renals, above the kidneys, and they produce this, right? And this is part of what helps us live and helps us wake up. We have a natural spike when we wake up in the morning. This is, again, if we're sleeping like we should be sleeping. And it kind of through the day goes down. If we eat, if we exercise, we bump it up. If we have a lot of sugar, we bump it up. The biggest slump is here, usually around 3 o'clock. Everybody, everybody knows that their biggest slump can be about 3 o'clock. <clears throat> and the slump is worse if we're pushing beyond our limits, right? Um, and so we have in green here is adrenal fatigue. And these are usually when we're pushing so much that we're actually not having it go down towards nighttime, but it's, we're actually pushing to try and keep awake all day. And this is adrenal burnout when we just don't really, our adrenal glands just aren't giving us enough cortisol. And so you start to see in these folks, this is where you see autoimmune diseases and that kind of thing. So I'm, I just briefly wanted to show you that. It's just a picture, it's, but it's very um, related to sleep. So how are we time-wise right now? Oh, okay, good. 
So I want to take some questions with this before I go into what we do about it. Does anybody have questions? Yeah. Um, okay, suppose you sleep five hours mm -hmm. and then you take a nap later on. Do you add those hours or hour whatever to the five hours? In other words, in the course of the 24 hours a day. It's a good question. Um, <laughs> we try to make up for sleep and we really shouldn't take naps in longer than about half an hour so we don't get into a REM cycle. How do you decide that? You, you, well, what you do is you try, to get, you try to get a good night of sleep. And it's fine, and it's actually really beneficial, a lot of cultures have this, to take an afternoon nap. But really taking much more than 30 to 45 minutes can actually impair the next night's sleep. So that's where you get into that. You, you, if you're going to do that, then you've got to probably set a timer so that you don't get into the cycle of taking an hour and a half nap or whatever uh, that, you know, in the afternoon and then impairing your, your nighttime sleep. So I always heard that your REM sleep happened during four hour periods, but it seems like no. that's not a... No, not this, is there, this is every, this is, now in most folks, like everybody can, you know, we can have a little variation, but mostly they're 90 minute things. And if you look at sleep studies for instance, people that go in, in, in sleep labs and have polysomnograms where they're hooked up to EEGs, um, uh, the, 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 the bellows thing that measures breast, you know, breath excursion, um, they have uh, pulse oximeters to measure oxygen, they have EKGs and all of that it will show you pretty much that this is pretty much what we have, is these 90-minute cycles. I wanted to ask about urinary incontinence that some of us have. Where I'm having to get up two or three times a night to go to the bathroom. Yes. And that really upsets the sleep. The sleep cycle. Yes, exactly. So that is a real problem, having nighttime awakenings from other physical conditions. And we can talk about that a little bit at the end. About, yeah, but that's a really good one to ask about, so remind me. Yes, so if you fall asleep, I fall asleep fine, mm -hmm. but every two hours I seem to wake up, and mm -hmm. then I fall back asleep pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Is that? Do you feel rested in the morning? No, a lot of times, no. Yeah, so that's, what you're having is you're not probably getting down into deep enough non-REM sleep, because, again, what I was telling you, the sensor gates are off, and if we get into that really deep, nourishing sleep, we don't have those repeat. Think about kids. I remember my kids were young. You know, like somebody could be, you know, pounding outside and all this stuff, and they'd sleep through it, and, you know, the house could be on fire, and the dog's barking, and they'd sleep through it, you know. So we're, as we get older, you know, it, and part of this is, is, is related to brain function and related also to our sympathetic drive. We have a sympathetic and parasympathetic, our autonomic nervous system, right, the fight or flight thing. And it can be, we're primed to a certain degree, you know. And so part of that is about actually, you know, being able to get into that deep sleep. Um, and so typically people who have frequent awakenings, um, I, and I would suggest them getting a sleep, a polysomnogram, to make sure you don't have sleep apnea. Because had you've had that check. So, you know, you. And they, I just slightly, but. Mm -hmm. Not enough to. That, the CPAP? I, the worst. I, like <laughs> I still had both. Like, yeah. Like right. So, what you, what then you want to work with that is actually, we'll talk about this. We're going to talk about how, how we work on achieving a deeper level of sleep. Uh, yeah, more efficient. Is, I never really noticed a problem until after menopause. Right. And as it's gone on, <laughs> yeah. it seems like my sleep has gotten worse. Yes. So is there a relationship yes. between those Yes. Yes. You'll, 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 um, there's a huge relationship between hormones um, and sleep. And what we see in women particularly, and women tend to have worse overall sleep, but men are catching up because we have a lot more sleep apnea in the men. Right, so it's a little bit of a different reason. Women, it's more hormonal usually, or obesity related, and that's not your problem, uh, you know. But one of the things that happens is there is protective effects from estrogen and progesterone on the brain, so and, and helping, and also thyroid hormone. So oftentimes, and those are all interrelated with cortisol. So those are not working independently. So if we're working with boosting cortisol and boosting and working with their sympathetic nervous system, 
then that also helps. But we see it a lot around, and thyroid hormone, around menopause, where women have sleep problems. Um, and I'll, well, I have Graves' disease. You have Graves', so you have a thyroid yeah. disorder and right so, off. But I, that was diagnosed in my early 30s, mm -hmm. and I had um, the radioactive iodine, mm -hmm. and eventually it did take thyroid hormone. But mm -hmm. that's monitored pretty carefully, yeah. so. But, it's taking a synthetic, you know, is never the same as having your own in response. So there's, so what I'm going to teach you, that's what I want to spend, I'm going to teach you some techniques for trying to achieve deeper sleep so that we don't wait. Because one of the bigger things that we have, and one of the, the problems that we have is not achieving a deep enough level of sleep when we sleep. So, and, and there's a thing is, is um, sleep onset insomnia, which is lesser in older folks, but sleep maintenance. So what you're having is a sleep maintenance issue. And even though you're in bed and sleeping, say, eight or nine hours a night, if you're having frequent awakenings, then you're, you're really not, it's showing us that you're not getting the deep non-REM sleep or good quality sleep. Any other questions before I? Mm -hmm. You mentioned before that um, the uh, afternoon doldrums around three o'clock mm -hmm. are. I think you said it's caused by a shortage of cortisol. Well, it's just when the cortisol's at the lowest. Is there any way to compensate that with nutritional supplements? Or something? Well, you can. You're. You're. Yeah, people take Mars bars. <laughs> <laughs> You know, chocolate bars. That's when people have chocolate and caffeine and, you know. No. Actually, what you try to do is work with, work with sleep and work with your diet and work with lifestyle so that that dip isn't as deep, you know, so that you can get through it without having to have a supplement. But, yes, a supplement may help. But we'll, we'll talk about that, okay? Because I'm going to talk about some herbs and things that, yeah, that might, that might really benefit somebody who has that really kind of slump. Um, so, but we're seeing younger and younger people, by the way, with sleep disorders, thyroid disorders. Used to be, you know, women really have like 10 times more thyroid disease than men. And it's very, the thyroid gland is such, it's, you know, it's right here. It's, it's our kind of, it determines our metabolic rate. And so it's absolutely necessary for life to have thyroid hormone. Um, so, and, and it's necessary for sleep, it's necessary for a number of physiologic functions. I once, when I was at Ohio State years ago, uh, they brought in a woman that was older who hadn't, they, they, it was a grandmother, was, do you remember Granny on the Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all of you. <laughs> well, they brought her in, she was in a rocking chair for two days and they had noticed finally that she, she hadn't moved in about two days. And so they thought she was dead and they took her pulse and she was still, it was very low, but she was, and she was still barely breathing. But she was so stiff and rigid that they actually couldn't get her out of the rocking chair. So they strapped her into the back of the pickup truck and drove her into the ER like that because she was just rigid. And she was so hypothyroid, she, her, her core temperature was about 92 degrees, which, I mean, it had been gradual. Like, but, you know, and you had to kind of warm her up and thaw her out and get some thyroid hormone. But it shows you what severe, severe hypothyroid, at least that was a real learning experience for me. Um, yeah, and she had no reflexes and was basically almost comatose. She was in a, what they call a myxedematous coma, basically. So um, anyway, but as we get older, you know, one of the things about this is one of the things I've learned with Ayurveda is they say that, for instance, uh, you know, we slow down as we age, right? I mean, we all do, and we're all going to die. So that's a known. Um, but we, sh you know, as far as neurodegenerative diseases and that type of thing, that isn't necessarily a natural thing just as hot flashes are not a natural thing. And we think in our culture that hot flashes are a natural thing, but they're not. So there's so many things that we've come to just accept as a part of aging that we don't have to accept. And there's also another saying, when, whenever I talk to people, I love this saying about like why bother with doing some of these things as we age, because we're gonna die anywhere. And I always, I like this saying, which I heard said to me once, is do you wanna die death by a thousand paper cuts? So it's kind of up to, it's up to us. What, what quality of life do we want to have? And what quality of living do we want to have? Um, so let me go on to, so I'm going to just 
take a little, uh, this is, I'm going to take and show you just a couple of things that, um, and then I'll talk about the, um, let me look at the time, 146, perfect. We have till I think 2.30, but, and we'll go over the sanctuary sleep, which is your handout. But I'm going to show you a couple things. This is going to be the show and tell time now. So I'm going to show you something um, that um, I think is, is kind of a lifesaver. When you wake up in the middle of the night, or if you can't fall asleep, um, st staying in bed is probably not the thing you want to do, right? And so some people will get up and watch TV or get on the computer, and that's also something you don't want to do. So what are some things you could do? Meditate. You could meditate, but what my, my, and I think it's a great, and I'm going to talk about meditation. I meditate every morning. But sometimes when your mind is racing, and one of, one of my teachers, Dr. Joshi, says, with American, he's Indian, he says, with Americans, I don't even start them on meditation. I start them on Shavasana, corpse pose, because they are cycling so much that we, we have to calm down their parasympathetic nervous system. So we want to do that first, calm down this before we get them into meditation. Because all they do in meditation is closed loop thinking. And they just get in, you know. So I'm going to show you some techniques. And, and some of you probably know these um, that, that I've learned. Um, and one of those, you can use pillows or a bolster. So this is kind of show and tell time now. Um, so if you were to wake up in the middle of the night, we know that you can, you can lay on your back to go to bed. So you can lay on your back to do this, too. And one of the most wonderful things you can do is lay with your feet up. Unless you have severe, severe glaucoma or severe, severe hypertension, you can do this. Um, so I'm going to show you corpse pose, which is just basically being like a corpse. It's preparing for death. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> I mean, why not, right? <laughs> I, I, had a, I had a rollover accident 20 years ago when I was 40, and I almost died. I had a C5 cord injury and, you know, and all that. And when I remember going, when I went and, um, I don't know who it was I talked to, it was a psychic or whatever, after they said, well, that's great. You're already prepared for death. You, you, have, you know, I had a near-death experience, out-of-body experiences. You're prepared for death. I thought, oh yeah, okay, that was that was good. So I'm going to show you corpse pose, and corpse pose is very easy. Everybody can do it. Um, and then I'm going to show you this other pose, kind of a restorative pose. Um, I had a teacher, Dr. Singh, who is also from India, who is both a physician and an Ayurvedic physician, both. And he did studies with hypertension in India and uh, found that doing corpse pose for 10 minutes a day for three months lowered people's blood pressure. That's pretty easy, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So corpse pose is basically this, in the middle of the day. So at that 3 o'clock time period, You lay like this and you just breathe. Do abdominal deep breathing. You shut off everything. If you want to listen to music, you can listen to some music. So this is something you can do for the slump. You're not, and you can do this if you wake up in the middle of the night. If you want to go. And the difference is you're on the floor instead of on the bed. Right, you're on the floor. So you're connecting with the ground and you're breathing into your. Now we do, yeah. This is this is even a better one. So if you have pillows or a bolster, or if you just want to lay on the floor, you can do this one too. And I do this a lot. And what's nice about this is that look at what it's doing for your chest. It's expanding your chest. So you can. It's a little easier to breathe. Your arms are down here. I have a pillow up there. I put a. Um, see that pillow. Thank you. And you can put pillows under your arms if you have, you know, if it's if it's painful. And you just do this for ten or fifteen minutes and just get up. Okay. <laughs> when you want to get up, and if you want, you can do it against a wall if you want. And a lot of folks can't because they're a little bit tight in their hamstrings, you know. But this is an inversion. This is a mild inversion. Inversion. This is incredibly good for the. Um, nervous system, and it's really good for the adrenal glands. I was talking about cortisol and the adrenal glands. You're actually having pressure put 
there on that, right? From your body weight. And it's great for breath because it's causing, most of us are hunched over, right? It's, it's causing you to open up your chest. And if this is too much, which it is sometimes for people, you just put pillows under your arms. And you just breathe. See, right now, I already feel like going to sleep. It's just, it's luscious. It's just, it's just amazing, right? Or if you were flat on the floor. You can be flat on the floor, too. Yeah, maybe put a little pillow under your, under your neck. Not, not as much as this. The reason I'm doing this, you see what's happening, is my body, my spine is completely supported, but my chest and every, you know, I'm, I'm kind of draped over it, right? So this offers something that, you know, but flat on the floor is great too because you're, you're having an inversion, your legs are higher. So also, if you have a little bit of ankle edema or foot pain or whatever, this is also really good for that, right? So to get out of it, you just do this, and then you roll off to one side. And sit there for a minute to kind of recalibrate. So both of these are really excellent for um, when we have insomnia, when we have hypertension, we have any sleep problem, or we're just really stressed out, right? Does it, does it help to do it from your bed? Because some of us can't get up. Right, so you can do it with your bed because you have a, if you have a firm mattress, yes. Um, it's good to have the support. And you could put pillows and put those up against, you know, but you want to have your legs higher than your head. So those are pretty easy, right? I mean. Your mind is racing, right. What you're doing is you focus on your breath. So you just focus on breathing. And if your mind's racing, just watch it. You just watch. All of us have mind racing. All of us have. But by doing this, you're training your nervous system. So it's not going to happen right away. But just like anything else we do, brushing our teeth, right, or flossing, or any, any repetitive activity trains our nervous system. So yes, it may not happen right away. But you didn't get to where you are right away either. So you don't go in, you know, it's, it's fine to think. But you're just going to also do this while you're thinking. And gradually, and sometimes you'll find you fall asleep with this. In fact, um, oftentimes when I do this, I fall asleep. And then I know I was pretty tired. And so that time in the afternoon when you're talking about that slump at 3 o'clock, you can try this as well. <laughs> you know, I used to do it. I used to do it at work as a physician, you know, on the days that I was I, just going nonstop. And I would just put... Um, the way I could keep people from bothering me, you know, my office was I would just say that I was breastfeeding. I put a little tag up, you know. <laughs> Nobody would ever come in and bother me. That's the only time they wouldn't bother me. So I would, just for 10 minutes in the afternoon, I would just say I'm pumping breast milk or something. And so um, <laughs> you can come up with your own thing. But you can, you can always take 10 minutes, right? You can take 10 minutes, right, in the middle of the day. And yeah. if you don't get a robocall. Exactly, but you can turn your phone off too. You can also put earplugs in. You put this. Is, you you want to actually block as many senses as you can. So if you need to put earplugs in, put earplugs in. I would suggest doing this because if there's pressure. Number one, there's pressure over your forehead. It's really nice, and it's it's very cooling. And, and some of these have lavender and what have you. And that's also you can also use essential oil. Put some essential oil in it. The one that you like. Like I suggest vetiver, lavender. Um, whatever one you like. Oh, Rose, awesome. vetiver, V-E-T-I-V-E-R. It's in the lemongrass family. It's wonderful. You have to try it. And you can use it in a diffuser as well. But also, so smells, you know, all those kind of things help with that. So I wanted to show you that. I also want to show you my other pitch for, for um, sleep and um, for hormonal. You were asking about deep sleep. One of the very best things you can do if you're not sleeping the very best, it's second on this list, is putting um, an oil on your body. Now, as we get older, we get drier, right? We shrivel up, right? Yeah. Itching, we get itchy, we get dry, our eyes get dry, our vaginas get dry, our everything gets dry, right? We get dry all over. And um, when we're babies, we're way more, we have way more moisture in us. But as we get older, we, we dry up, you know. So... What can we do to offset that? Well, a lot of people drink water. That's great. But we also, one of the things that we need more than anything is oil. Why do we need oil? Our brains are, what percent fat? 60%. 60 to 65% fat. 
So we are not getting good enough quality oils usually in our food because we eat a lot of processed food, which is, we, are, we, we know that now. We know what happened with the not eating fats and what that did for us, right? We, we know now it's kind of come back around. But what I want to what I want to talk about is healthy fats. So what's a good way? What, our brains have a lot of insulation in, in them, right? Just like telephone wires. And if you lose insulation, you, lo you lose nerve conduction, right? So if we're not, and it's not about how much we weigh or how much we don't weigh. If we're underweight or overweight or good weight, it's about good quality oils. And so I'm going to talk about a few good quality oils around the handout. And one of the best things you can do, and this is really ancient, is to um, drop the oil, is to put warm oils, if you're not sleeping well, is to put warm oils on your body. Why? Body's the biggest surface area. It's the biggest organ we have is the skin, right, on our body. So what's the easiest way, and, and it's got the most nerve receptors of anywhere in our body is our skin. So what's the easiest way to pacify our nervous system? putting warm oil on our body. Massage, we, we can't always go out and get a massage, but we can do it for ourselves. So an ounce or two of warm oil, and you can use sesame oil. You can, in the summer, mix in a little coconut with it. You know, it's cooler if it's hot. Here, it tends to be like a day like this, I would just use sesame, but you can use this before bed. You can wear old pajamas if you want, or you can shower it off after about 10 or 15 minutes. This is one of the most, and, and for the winters here, I just spent a winter here, my first winter back. I used to live in Boston for a while, but I did a lot of, so did Gail, <laughs> a lot of oiling to keep, because it's dry, right? And it's very, it's, so winter is drying, older age is drying, our diets are drying, um, looking at computers is drying, pretty much everything we do is drying. Alcohol is very drying, yeah, and I, didn't get to, and I'm just going to, when I get to the handout, talk about the drugs that are drying. Every single drug, every drug in the Western pharmacopoeia is drying, except for the hormones. Those are building. They're nourishing and building, like thyroid hormone, replacement, um, you know, reproductive hormones, etc. cetera. Um, but we can, what do we build our hormones from? We build them from cholesterol. What is cholesterol from? It's from good fat. So we can make better hormones and healthier hormones by really paying attention to all the fats we use, both what we ingest and what we put on our skin. And I know it sounds antithetical. I mean, folks don't want to do it. It's one of the hardest things I, I, I when I see patients, one of the hardest things that um, I have to sell is, is for them to put oil on three nights a week. I say, just do it three nights a week. And if you can't do it, put a little bit on the tip of your head and put it on your feet, rub your feet with it. And if you can't do that, then, you know. Um, I, I just have a side story, but when, for years as a physician, when I would ask people what meds they were on, they would go, you know, I'm on, I'm on a green pill and a red and white pill, and I'm on an orange pill. And I say, how much is in your checkbook? And they can tell me just like that. And I'm like, okay, and um, do you know what you have left for your mortgage? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and they know what year their car is, and they know all those things. They don't know about their own bodies. They don't know what they're putting in their bodies. And that <clears throat> kind of blew me away. It, it really, really blows me away that people will kind of, um, you know, outsource their, their, their health to other people. And yet, they're very aware of their finances and what they own. And, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's part of it is, is that we're not really wanting to take the time to take care of us. And I'd ask them, how much TV do they watch at night? You know, when they say they can't lay 10 minutes on the floor, you know. So it's not a judgment, but what it is, is it's where you where you're going to put your attention and your energy and where you decide to do this. And so one of the biggest things, really, is, is to think about this. And it's on the handout where you can get the oils. I'm going to pass this one around and this one around just so you see it and hold on to it. And you're going to think, oh, it's really gross, gross and oily. But you can, there's stuff you can put in, you can do it. And, and leave, like all winter long, I just had old flannel pajamas. So I just put on an ounce and go to bed with it. Um, are there other oils? I mean, are there sweet oil, like olive oil? Um, olive oil is OK. That's a good one. Um, almond oil, for some, is good. Coconut oil is cooling, so not in the winter here. Sesame oil is probably, the reason I love sesame oil and why they typically all these oils are a base of sesame oil is that as we get into older 
age, this is probably one of the most nourishing ones. Mm -hmm. And it has the highest amount of calcium of pretty much anything. Also, if you have any dental problems or any uh, gum periodontitis, you wear dentures, anything, you can do oil pulling with, with sesame oil. You put it in for 10 minutes every morning and do this. You, um, it, it nourishes the good bacteria in your mouth. So it's one of, and as an ENT, I can just tell you, it's the, the best thing you can do for your mouth. And it has the highest amount of calcium, so that's taken up into your bones. So particularly for postmenopausal women, it's a beautiful, simple, simple thing to do. You can walk your dog doing it. You can do it in the shower. Yeah, about a tablespoon. Oh, and yeah, ten minutes. Mm -hmm. I used to do it while I walked my dog. And my neighbors just had to get used to, you know. Um, so, <laughs> and then you spit it out and you rinse your mouth. But you can look it up. It's called oil pulling. So oils. And, and it also is very good for people who do a lot of speaking, public speaking, teachers, people with any type of gum problems. I went from having to get my teeth cleaned, you know how you, they want you to get them cleaned every six months, to about every year and a half, and they never find any plaque anymore. It's just from doing this. It's nothing else. How often do you do it? Every day. Yeah. But at least five days a week. First thing in the morning, before your coffee. Actually, you don't want to have coffee first thing in the morning anyway. You want to have water. So your kidneys don't. So you you so these are things that you can do. But the oiling, and I have on the handout where you can watch a video. It's a seven minute video, I believe, on on why and what and how you do it. I don't get any returns on this other than I when I see clients that have sleep problems, I'm going to tell you this works. This work. It doesn't work overnight. It's not a sleeping pill. But I will talk about what sleeping pills do and don't do. So. <laughs> That's a quick fix. The other oil that's really great is ghee, and ghee, which is clarified butter. So it's butter that's been, it's been, it's butter that's been cooked for about 10 or 15 minutes. The solids, the milk solids, separate to the bottom, and you strain off over cheesecloth. You can make it. I make my own, and there's great butter up here in Vermont, right? Um, and this does not. It's been studied. It does not raise cholesterol. I mean, unless you have massively high cholesterol, like say above 300. Um, but it's a very, very good nourishing brain food. In fact, one of my teachers, Dr. Ladd, says the, ball, the brain is just one big ball of ghee. So it's called ghee. <laughs> so I want, I want, so I just feel like by smell it, see it, and, and it doesn't, the other thing about it is you can leave it out on the counter. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. You can make it. Um, it's cheap to make because you just make with butter. You can look up online how to make it or you can buy it. Um, it's really great to get butter kind of now in the spring, right, from grass-fed cows. That's the, the very best butter to make ghee from. But you can use it. You can put it in your nose if you have a dry nose. You can warm it up as long as it's, you, you know, you're not putting dirty spoons in it. You have to always put a clean spoon in, nothing wet, so it doesn't get moldy, but it can stay on the counter forever. It doesn't get rancid or anything. It doesn't get rancid. Because the milk solids are, as long as you strain it through cheesecloth or you buy it. And, um, it helps your nose. It helps your nose. With nasal congestion or dryness. Oh, it's beautiful. And dry eyes. We all have dry eyes as we get older, right? Who has dry eyes? OK, yeah. So one of the things you can do is you can put warm ghee, especially in the winter when you're really dry, you can put a couple drops in your eyes at night. Right in your eyes, on the whites of your eyes. Just do this, and it's so nourishing. It's wonderful. It's been around for thousands of years. Trust me, I've done it for years. You just warm it up. You don't put a big slab of it in there. You know, you warm it up. You put it in a little. Mm -hmm. I have someone has a dairy allergy. Can they use ghee? Yes. If you have properly made ghee, yes, you can, because the milk solids with the casein are out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Eating, you can put it in your eyes, you can put it in your nose. You can actually, and for women, you can put it in your vagina for dry, for because for, we're dry all over, right? So, yeah, it can be used in all those places. But you can cook with it, too. It has a high flash point. In fact, um, it's one of the best cooking oils because it does have a high flash point and isn't degraded with heat. Because a lot of oils, you know, like, you don't really want to cook high, high heat with olive oil. I mean, really, olive oil is a finishing oil. It's not really a cooking oil. Um, that, you know, 
and, it, and if you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't tolerate ghee, you can use flaxseed oil. But um, ghee's, ghee's a lovely, and you can put olive oil if that's what you want to put. I would put, I would always put organic, right? Because the skin, this is a big thing with anything dairy, um, you really want to have organic because the, um, there's so many toxins in, in, um, that are being used to raise our animals. And one big one is antibiotics. Another one is pesticides and herbicides and all that. And when we have antibiotics in our dairy, meat, whatever, and, the, and you know why they give them antibiotics is so that they grow faster and quicker. But we do the same thing when we have the antibiotics. Plus, we're seeing now that it affects our microbiome, right? It changes our gut bacteria. So you really, really, if you're going to do one thing organic, it should be any dairy or meat you eat, and then you can look at whatever vegetables. And, and I mean, I would say eat all organic if you can. Um, yes? Tea tree oil? Tea tree oil is, okay, tea tree oil is a great antiseptic, and it's a great one if you want to put, if you, like, if you want to, but it's not something you would use, you know, but if you were to have like staph infections, it's a really great one. Well, my, my one son from equipment, you know, from sports would sometimes get staph infections or impetigo, and you can put a couple drops in the tub. So it's great to use that if you want to use it in the tub. But, and, and if you want to add it, add it to your mouth, your mouth one, to your sesame oil. Add a drop of either tea tree oil or frankincense oil to the, um, uh, sesame oil that you're going to oil pull with. And particularly for people that have periodontitis. And I'm telling you one thing, because I would have my patients, particularly the, the vets, you know, because we had a lot of vets that had, um, uh, from the VA hospital, you know, that had um, head and neck cancers. Just a high prevalence in that population because of drinking and smoking, what have you. But they would get radiation, and they would have the driest mouth. So they'd make no more saliva. And so what remaining teeth they had would fall out. They'd have terrible periodontitis. Terrible it's food. They couldn't taste food. It was so dry. Had got you know you couldn't get them to do much of anything. But they would oil. They would they would put oil in their mouth because it was the one thing that really really helped them. I'm going to be jumping ahead, but what about um, CBD oil on your tongue? Okay, we're going to talk about that in a minute. What about we, jojoba oil? Jojoba oil is okay too. That's another oil that we, best to put oils on warm though, right? How do you warm? You take, let's see, you've got your oil in a little, get a little, you know, from the pharmacy, get a little squeeze bottle, right? And then heat up some oil in the microwave. Don't put the oil in the microwave or on the stove and take it off and then just put the bottle in it for a little bit and have it warm. Yeah, and some hot water. You know, so you do, you're doing it separately in the hot water. And you can just get a little, I didn't bring one with me, but you can get a little one. Um, the last thing I'm going to pass around before I... Oh, good. We still have to. Is I'm going to pass around some herbs, um, and one of the things I'm doing my thesis on is is the, the herbs that are nootropics, and that means herbs that improve memory and cognition. They've been around for a long time. We're studying them in Western medicine now, but um, uh, one would be goat cola. Another one is bacopa. Um, ashwagandha. Anybody that has thyroid disease should be on ashwagandha, and I can talk about it at the end. You can, um, but these are herbs that improve memory, improve cognition, and they've been. We can look it up now. There's studies showing it. They've been around forever, but it's a whole herb as opposed to an extract. So I would say I've been taking bacopa, and um, I've been taking these for years. So um, I'm just going to pass them around. And there's a thing called Medja Rasayana. This is in the ancient texts. And Medja is, Rasayana is a rejuvenative. So all in the holistic medicine, everything from about menopause or, men go through menopause too. It's called menopause. Um, <laughs> um, um, any, so what, what it said is really when we get into our 40s, we start to lose memory. We all know that, right? And that happened to all of us, but we don't, we have slowing down, but we don't have to completely slow down. We don't have to develop a neurodegenerative disease. We don't have to develop those things. I mean, we're really, there, there's things that we can do to either stave it off or to have. So this is from the ancient text from thousands of years ago. A major resina is a brain resina, and resina means a rejuvenative. So this is, I'm just showing it to you. You can read the back of it. It won't mean anything. but. It is something that has been there for years and that 
we can do to, it doesn't mean we're not going to age, but to make us have a healthy aging and to have, um, you know, better brain function. And I'm spending, this is, okay, one more, Stress Ease, which has also got the same of these herbs if you just want to take a tablet, Banyan Botanicals, and they're listed on the handout. So I just am now going to go over the handout. Everybody has the handout? No. Okay, we have, we're going to, you're going to have to get a couple from up front. I brought, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, um, I think I have three left. Okay, you need one? She made bigger, um, yeah. And if you don't, yeah. Okay. Um, so you'll have to get one out front. I'm sorry if you, we, we had more than we thought. So let's go over this. We have 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, so the Sanctuary of Sleep. So I'm going to go over these. They're not necessarily in the order of importance, but sort of. One, have a routine bedtime each night. Fall asleep by 10 p.m. as late nights are drying and rob your body of subtle digestion time. There's no antidote for lost sleep. Make sure to get at least seven hours of sleep a night. I just showed you how to apply the warm oils. This is just telling you about this and telling you a place where you can look at a video on it and don't, you don't have to say sorry. Um, so I've gone over that about self-oil massage. It is, trust me on it, just try it. I've had people that cannot sleep. When they finally get in, just even three nights a week, just try it. And again, if you can't do your whole body, and you'll see on the video how to do it, just do your feet every night. And, and, and maybe the top of your head, okay? Just, you know, everybody can do that. And put some socks on and go to bed. Um, why, why the feet? And this is in all ancient traditions. Hmm? All the points, all the, um, the chi and all the... Right. A lot of the We have an acupuncturist here. Why, why the feet? <laughs> uh, it's the basis of our energy. Everything is going to up. Everything from the ground up. Yeah. yeah. Also, it takes us out of our heads. <laughs> right. What if you have your fungal infections? I use Vicks Vapor Rub on my feet. Okay. okay, there you go. You can try, and you could try, you could also do tea tree oil and sesame oil, because tea tree is an antiseptic, antifungal, it's amazing, frankincense also. If you want, you can try those too with it, yeah. Um, you can also try putting silver rings on your toes, because fungus don't like silver. So you can, try, that's just another thought, if you want to buy some, cool silver rings and you'll be pretty Where do you get that? well you'll have to look I don't know <laughs> yeah I mean they, they don't like silver fungal fungal infections I mean I'm not saying this is an overnight cure either nothing by the way all of this none of this is overnight and and you know the overnight cures like sleeping pills are not a cure either because I'm going to talk about them warm okay for those who can take milk and, or, and, and preferably if you can get raw milk, which fortunately you can get here in Vermont. We couldn't in Texas when I used to live there. Um, warm almost to boiling whole, preferably raw or non-homogenized, at the least non-homogenized. Milk spiced with a pinch each of nutmeg, which is a soporific. Um, cardamom, turmeric, and a couple threads of saffron if you have it before bed. Very, very pacifying for the nervous system. And milk, again, if you can take it has a lot of good fats for your brain, and it has serotonin, which is very helpful for sleep. And, the, and if you're lactose intolerant, you can use the lactate? You can use the lactate milk, or you can use and almond milk. put vanilla extract in it. Perfect. That's the if best you, way to go to sleep. Yes, perfect. So that's a really good point. Yes, if you're, if you're lactose intolerant, or, but play around with that. These are things to play around with. The oil is like huge. Number one, getting, trying to have a routine bedtime is huge. And usually with elderly people or people from menopause on, I'm, I'm not having so much of a problem with, people are, are pretty much good about, well, most people are. It's the younger folks that are really pushing the envelope on, on sleep time. You know, you, you all remember when you stay up past 10, 10.30, you get a second wind, right? Mm -hmm. Right? You know, we use that, right? 
when we were studying for college and all those things. But it's at the expense of your liver. That's when subtle digestion occurs. So you're really trashing your liver by staying up. That's, that's liver time. When is kidney time again? It's kidney time is late afternoon. Yeah, and, but in the middle of the night, when is kidney time? Kidney time, liver time. Yeah, yeah. So each of our organs has a time. And I, can sh I don't have the chart with me, but the, each organ has a time. So when you push beyond, then you're, those, those organs are, are, are not getting the nourishment they need. Um, and you can. Did you hear anything about cancer or oil? Yes. So castor oil is, um, it is used actually in, in, in a lot of holistic medicines. You can put castor oil in your eyes. Very safe to put in your eyes, particularly if you have a lot of burning. If you have dry eyes that burn, you can use castor oil. And, you, and they're very good for the eyelashes if you get um, infections around the edges of the eyelids, you know, styes a lot and that kind of thing. Castor oil can be for women that have cramps or people that have cramps and, and, and constipation. It can be put on the abdomen and um, externally with a, a hot water bottle, not a heating pad. So that's really good for it decongesting the pelvis and helping with, with that. But as far as taking it internally, it's heating and it's a cholagogue, so it causes the liver to contract and, 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 and it is used sometimes for um, it's used for constipation, as we know, but it's pretty, it can be pretty violent, too. So it, it's not a first go-to for constipation. And for, um, but it is used, it, it does actually cause the bile ducts and the, and the, you know, the liver to kind of squeeze things out. So. Can cancer oil also uh, cause thickening of the blood? Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. That, that one I don't know. I mean, you mean take it because usually when you take castor oil, you take it internally and you take up to a tablespoon, only organic, because castor oil has, you know, it's got really, they use hexane to, which is a, you know, a hydrocarbon, to, you know, like, like gasoline to, to extract it. So you want just, you want, whenever you're taking castor oil, it always has to be organically, not, not the, the, um, you have, to, you have to look at that. Um, okay, so I talked about, oh, and there's an herb that you can add, go to cola or Brahmi herb to the milk. So I passed around these herbs, but you can look online and you can get Brahmi herb, and it's, it's right here, and you can add that to your milk and you can practice with that if you want. It, it, Brahmi is really delivered really well with milk or with fats, so taken with milk, it really um, is absorbed quite well. Um, Brain and nervous are 60% fat. As I said, I already talked about ghee. Avoid processed foods. Avoid MSG. We probably all know that. Food dyes, coloring, artificial flavors, artificial sweeteners, they all act as excitotoxins. So they're brain neurotoxins. And it's not so much in this group, but it's in the younger. When I used to talk to younger families um, and mothers, I used to always put up a thing of um, Skittles, you know, the candy Skittles. The only food in Skittles is high fructose corn syrup. That's the only food. The rest is carnauba wax, about 10 different like Red Lake, and these are all terrible neurotoxins. So we have to really watch that with our young people. I don't think that there's probably any Skittles addicts out here, but, um, but all the candies and all the dyes and all those things are neurotoxins. So they're, they're, they're not good things for our brains. Um, Make sure to have at least 30 minutes outdoors exercise each day. You talked about exercise. I just want to tell you for, to, to clock in your circadian rhythm, having 30 minutes at least. And I was talking, I talked to women's groups when I was in Texas. I could not believe how many people did not meet that each day, did not get at least 30 minutes outside. Um, and this doesn't matter if it's a snowy day, a rainy day, or whatever day. Inside, these lights have, um, you know, lumens, right? And so outside lumens, above 20,000. Inside, I mean, in the hundreds. And it, is, it really makes a difference for our circadian rhythm and the whole, the whole thing. Um, so much so that in Indonesia, where they have done visual... Um, 
uh, tests on kids going into recruit into the army uh, for years, and they have that data. They've noticed that the number of kids requiring glasses by the age of 18 or whenever they're recruited is up to like 80, 90 percent. Um, and part of it is because these kids get no ambient light. It's all indoor light or computers. And I talked about blue light. Um, and you notice this, right, with when now with all the LED lights on headlights when you're driving at night. Even if they have the same lumens, they're much more, blue light is, we're much more sensitive to it. Um, okay. How am I doing for time? Good. All right. Um, so I talk, oh, and vitamin D. Big, big in cold areas, vitamin D. Now they say the levels, hmm? D3. D3. Mm -hmm. Big, 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 very big. So um, D3, yes, and you know they say the level should be 30, right? And meaning your, your blood level. But a lot of us probably don't have that up here, so make sure you have, especially here in Vermont, that you take vitamin D. You can get it mixed with your calcium pill, yeah. But, and, and periodically you might want to have it checked, particularly if you're having sleep problems, okay? Because you should really be nice to have it above 50. But it's just, I don't think we're getting enough of it. Um, How much did you say? Um, well, you want your blood level to be above 30, you know, the, the, the weight, you know, but as far as the pills, the 1,000 IU, I take 2,000. 2,000 is a good number. 2,000 is a good number. You're right on, so that's good. Um, but above, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 is really good. And I would say for here, I put that for here, particularly. Um, Wind down, okay, here's the last number eight. Wind down before bed. Between 7 and 10 p.m., the nervous system needs to wind down. Avoid watching TV or being on the computer or electronics at least one or two hours before bed as they stimulate the nervous system and block melatonin production. I mentioned that already. Avoid caffeine any time after noon. It has an eight-hour half-life. You can teach others about this. Um, avoid alcohol in the evening. First, it's a stimulant. Then it's a central nervous system depressant. Okay, so what it does, it'll cause maintenance insomnia. You'll fall asleep, but you won't stay asleep. And all of us know that from that, that drink alcohol or have. I, I don't drink alcohol anymore, but um, it, it causes um, suppression of non-REM sleep. So again, that's when neural sanitation occurs. That's why people, if you've ever seen anybody go into DTs, you know, delirium tremens, getting up, they go psychotic, you know, because that's partly loss of non-REM sleep. Um, so, yeah, it's a big one. And people just think they're going to take a nightcap, and that's, you know, that is really, really a misnomer. Um, I, can't, I can't stress that enough. And I have spent 31 years as an ENT. My first 10 years in practice when I was in Boston was dealing with head and neck cancers, and pretty much all of them were alcoholics, alcoholic or alcoholic plus smoker. It is so toxic to the nervous system. Um, and it is not a sleep aid. It is not a sleep aid. And if when people said, oh, the Reservatrol, I said, have grape juice. Or, you know, I mean, you get Reservatrol from grape juice, right? And so, um, so avoid sleeping pills. They sedate the brain and they suppress non-REM sleep. So right now, there, is, there are studies to show that there's a four to five fold increase of early death on people who have been on sleeping pills long term. So if you are one of them, start working on getting off of them. And uh, they sedate the brain, they suppress non-REM sleep, they cause daytime drowsiness, memory loss, and increased risk of multiple diseases. Right now, the American Medical Association has finally taken them off of a first-line thing for sleep disorders. Thank God. Um, but I can't stress enough not having... And they make beautiful names for them, you know, Ambien and... I mean, they have gorgeous names for the sleeping pills. I, I just, it's so creative. Yeah. I've just gone off Ambien. Yay. Yeah. Well, but um, I'm taking melatonin. Fine. Uh, but melatonin, and they have a, a, a pill now that has, it, it's two different levels. So, like it takes from going to sleep and from maintenance. For, for maintenance. So, it's much, much better to have melatonin than a sleeping pill. Yeah. Should I take it? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. I just recently heard, though, that you take melatonin long term. Yeah, you don't, see that's what, it's, you're, it's a stepwise thing for a while. It's a, and it's a great thing if you're doing international travel, 
you take it at the time you should normally be going to bed for wherever time zone you're in to get your sleep started. So it's a great travel aid and it's a great for coming off a sleeping pill, but also these other techniques that I'm showing you and the oiling and having the good fats in your diet are imperative. Um, and then I've got a few more things too. So you shouldn't take melatonin long -term. No, no. It's not a long-term sleeping aid, yeah. Um, so the sleeping pills, it's huge. You know, there was, like I told you, there's an uptick in 2002 in Ambien, if any of you had stock in the company that, I forget what company. I mean, really, I mean, they made 24 billion in that next two years in profits. And, and part of it is because we are sleeping less, so people are resorting to sleeping pills, a lot of sleeping disorders. Aren't doctors told not to, to give older people, like us, um, Ambien? I thought Ambien was very bad. I mean, I did take it for a while, too. Yeah, it causes, yeah, it's got a lot of things, including because it suppresses non-REM sleep, it, it increases the risk now of Alzheimer's. There's studies to show that. And, and dementia, um, a lot of, it's, it's really... Not, a, not, not good, not good. Um, avoid electronics in the bedroom. We talked about why. Avoid eating late, heavy dinners. Eat the last meal greater than three hours. And these are all things you can look at, you know, in your lifestyle, right? Last meal, three hours before bed. Have lukewarm or room, room temperature water with meals. Make, thank you for coming. Make lunch your largest meal of the day, right? Because... If we have dinner as the largest meal, we're going to bed with a full stomach or a near full stomach. We're really meant to eat our largest meal um, at lunchtime. So lighter, lighter dinners, again, this for everybody. That's, avoid exercising within two to three hours of bed. And it's really more in the younger people that I have this issue. This doesn't mean walking. I'm talking about heavy exercise because this increases adrenaline and cortisol and delays that onset of sleep. So you include swimming with that. Um, in the evening, yeah, that's when they have it the yeah I, I, here's what I would say with swimming. Swimming is wonderful if, as long as you're not doing it really exertional. But if you're swimming in a heavily chlorinated pool, that's also a toxin and it's absorbed in. Oh, they use the fluoride. Okay, a little, it's better. Yeah. Um, but any heavy exercise at night, and I don't usually, it's usually in the younger population where we have to talk about that. Avoid naps after 3 p.m. Keep naps to half an hour or less. We talked about why earlier because then you get into and then here's a really cool thing. Consider Yoga Nidra which is a guided relaxation tape. Um, and You can look it up. You can look ones up. There's an app called Insight Meditation app if you want to just be you know you, you, whoops. you can get it for your phone and um, pick, pick one that you like and listen to it. So they're guided meditation. Um, and what I would do is try those out in the afternoon and see if you like those. So if you have a nighttime where you're, and sometimes we all have nights at, at times when we can't sleep, you can do one of these and listen to a yoga nidra. And nidra means sleep. Um, and you, these are just things to try. You can try all of these things. Um, consider legs up the wall pose breathing slowly into the belly for 10 minutes before going to bed, or this pose right here. Or if you wake up, this is a good one to do. Um, consider a meditation practice to start your day in the morning. Um, I wouldn't say to go to that first if you're having severe sleeping problems. I would say to go to some of these other methods first and then add in. But meditation is great for everybody, and it's a great way to, I was talking about these sleep waves, and there's lots of studies to show that when you sleep, you have more of these deep waves, and you, and, and you improve non-REM sleep, and a lot less of these beta waves, even during the day. So, you know, really long-term meditators and yogis, when they study their brains, they have a lot less of the beta waves and a lot more of the deep waves, and that's already been shown, so. Um, consider doing a restorative yoga class once weekly to train your nervous system what total relaxation is and to promote healthy sleep. I don't know because I'm not living here, but I'm pretty certain that there's probably some um, yoga classes here that are restorative in Montpelier. I would assume that there are. And so, for, you know, and what this is doing, all of these things are doing is training your nervous system. So you're retraining your nervous system, um, and you can pick and choose, but I would say, you know, these 
top couple are really important. Also, I forgot to mention temperature in the sleeping place. You want it to be cooler. Cool helps us go into deeper sleep. Not as much of an issue here as it is in other places. Um, and then consider listening to music, playing music, reading something pleasant, walking your dog, using aromatherapy. I mentioned aromatherapy if you're taking baths at night or when you're taking showers, you can put those around. Um, rose, jasmine, neroli, um, vetiver, relax the CNS. Um, and you can also consider taking, if you're really, really having problems with sleeping, doing the oiling and then taking a bath before sleep. And don't worry about cleaning up till the next day. Um, so the last disclaimer that I have is that a sleep disorder is broadly defined as a physical or psychological problem that impairs your ability to sleep or causes increased sleepiness during the day. We all have sleep problems from time to time. We can be very stressed out. You know, we, we can't get away from the things that happen in life. However, you might have a sleep disorder and, cons and should consult your physician if you regu regularly experience difficulty sleeping three nights weekly for three months or more and you haven't had a checkup to see if there's some other underlying condition. You're often sleepy during the day or have impaired ability to perform regular daytime activities, even if you've slept seven to eight hours, okay? Really what you wanna shoot for is having seven to eight hours of sleep every night, always. Your partner or other has told you snore loudly and sometimes stop breathing. What I used to just have people do is just have somebody tape them and then they bring in the tape, you know, because everybody's got cell phones now and you could hear if somebody's doing this, I mean, they're having some apnea. And even snoring can be, people can be having apnea even just with snoring. So it's, um, and note the AMA, the American Medical Association, no longer suggests sleeping pills as a first line treatment for insomnia. Be referred to a sleep specialist. So any of you that have really severe long term sleeping, these are all things to do. But if you haven't seen a physician, I would suggest doing that and being worked up. Because what if you have a thyroid disorder? What if you have an autoimmune disease? What if you have a number of different things? You know, you could have sleep apnea. And then there's some references here. Um, this is not everything. I just picked a few that I think are really great. And um, consider also taking... Um, fish oil as well, if, you, if you're, you know, or cod liver oil. Um, so thank you all for your attention. If you have any um, questions, I'm happy to stay and answer them. Thank you. Oh, you answered most of your questions. Okay, thank you. Have you ever discussed guided therapy with people with the Yes, so cognitive therapy. Right, so cognitive therapy, and I'm sorry, I, I think it's...